Good to have our guests with us this morning. Let's welcome, you don't have to stand up, raise your hand, just there are guests among us. You're welcome. Glad to have you. Always good to have friends in church. Amen. Amen. Hopefully everybody in church is your friend. If not, we need to talk. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> We're looking at the uh, Word of God this morning. I'm I'll tell you, because our study, what we're doing on Sunday mornings is we're following a study. Uh, the content is from Answers in Genesis. And uh, our children in Children's Church are learning the same material that we are upstairs so that we're all on the same page. So when we go home from here, any questions the little kitties have, you have the answer. Uh, we're all learning the same material. We're going to be talking about the Word of God for the next couple of weeks, and then we'll go into other topics and ultimately um, the entire Word of God. I'm, I, um, I believe this to be vitally important to the church, and I'll get into it in just a moment. In the, in the, in the middle of the message, I'll, I'll, give, um, I'll shed a little bit more light. But uh, we are looking this morning at God's Word is our guide. As we carefully have established, I hope, over the last few weeks, God's Word is the ultimate authority in truth. Amen. God has chosen to reveal Himself through His written Word. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know God? If you want to know God, if you want to know who He is, if you want to know what He wants, if you know, want to know what He's like, if you want to know God and all things related to God, there is only one way you can do that. And that is in His Word and through His Word. Because He has chosen to reveal Himself in His Word. And He calls us unto Himself. He calls us to learn of Him. It's only possible as we diligently study His Word. Now He's revealed Himself in, uh, he's revealed his existence in creation. I don't know where this picture is. It's a beautiful picture. Have you, st have you ever stood at a place of beauty? God's allowed me to travel in places. I've stood at uh, Victoria Falls and seen the perpetual rainbow because of the, the mist uh, rising up from Victoria Falls. It will take your breath away. I've stood at the, the mouth of the Grand Canyon. Have you, have you been to the Grand Canyon? Yeah. Uh, the various other places, uh, the deserts in, in Zimbabwe, beautiful. Uh, I mean, you, you've been to places in the world. You've seen the beauty of God's creation. God has chosen to reveal his existence in creation. You go outside and you, you look up into a night sky and you say, there is a God. <laughs> there must be a God. But he's chosen to reveal his person through his word. We said last week. You go out and look up into a night sky and know there's a God, but you're not going to necessarily know uh, there's a trinity or that there's a, a Savior who died on the cross. The nature is not going to reveal uh, his person, but his word has revealed his person. We must always interpret scripture in the immediate context first before we look for further understanding. We talked about that. Let's, let's reiterate it. You look at, if you read a verse of scripture, you look at it in its immediate context. What are the, what's the verse before and the verse after? What's the chapter say? What's, what point is being made here? How does that fit in the book in which it is found? And then how does that book fit in the overall word of God, the overall, the whole Bible? You, you, otherwise, what we tend to do is we take a verse of scripture and we look at ver words and we say, oh, I know what that word is somewhere else. And we go and we chase words. We're chasing symbols. We're chasing um, ideals and thoughts and concepts rather than looking at the context in which that word is written. You follow me? So when we look at the scriptures, we look, first of all, what is the context? Why was this written? To whom? When? Uh, and then we look at how it fits in with the rest of the Word of God. The responsibility, friends, to understand God's Word is very great. And we must take it seriously. 
Here, here as, as pastor, here as a, as a minister of the gospel, I am, I am um, uh, I'm alarmed. Because the importance of God's word, the, the uh, necessity of diligently studying God's word has been placed on the back burner. And in the modern world and in the modern church, God's word has, uh, and, and study of his word has fallen into um, uh, unfashionableness. Is that a word? Unfashionability? Unfashion? Fallen out of fashion. But the Bible tells us, Paul writing to Timothy, he says, study to show thyself approved um, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When, when he says study, literally he's saying give due ju- diligence. Give diligence. Diligently study. Put some effort into your study. Amen. That means not a promise box. You know what promise box is? Promise box, a little bread of life, little, you know, you buy them at the, at the, the bookstore, at the counter. A little promise box. And every day is a new promise from God. Well, you know, there's some promises from God that they'll never make it to the promise box. Those promises that say if you, uh, if you walk in disobedience, you're going to suffer the consequences. Those promises, <laughs> they don't make it to the promise box. But if you diligently study in God's word, you'll see. Friends, let me just say, I have had my face ripped off by the word of God. (laughs) Times when I wasn't in uh, step with God, when I needed to be disciplined, and I read God's word and conviction came. Don't ever run from conviction, friends. Don't ever run from the chastening of the Lord. The Bible says he, whom he loves, he chastens. So I'm talking about diligently studying God's word. Paul the Apostle says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Understand this. This doesn't mean that if we study, we'll get God's approval. Listen. Because if that's what was meant here, then we would be under uh, a works-based salvation. The more I study, the more God approves of me. Uh, the, the, you know, and I'm working towards my salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying, study to show thyself approved. In other words, study diligently that you might show that you are approved of God. Amen. And that you have been approved. When, when you are, and how do we get approved by God? We come to him through Jesus Christ, his son. We confess that we're sinners, we're lost, and we're hopeless, and we need a Savior. And we acknowledge what Christ has done. And we accept the gift of His uh, salvation on the cross. And our sins are washed away. The Spirit of God renews us, makes us sons and daughters of the living God. And we stand approved before Him. You should be shouting right now. At least whispering amen. Because it isn't anything that you've done. It's what he has done. And approval by God is solely based upon the cross. We sang about it this morning. And once we have come to him and we now are justified, we are now approved, we've been accepted in the beloved, now we study to show that we are approved. We study because we love his word and we want to learn more about him because we have been approved of God. Paul's saying study diligently, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not uh, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's important, friends. That's our responsibility. Rightly dividing. In other words, the, the, the Greek literally means making a straight line. Not being curved, not being, listen, not going to the right or to the left, but rightly dividing. The word of God. Understanding God's word. That's our responsibility. So, uh, Deuteronomy 11:18. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul. And bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. God speaking to Moses, he says, know my word. 
diligently study my word, rightly divide my word in essence, hide it in your hearts. The psalmist said, your word, Lord, I've hidden in my heart that I wouldn't sin against you. I want to know his word. I want to hide it in my heart. And he says, and do this. Love my word so much that, that, that it's written on your hand and it's, and it's like um, placed between the eyelets or between your eyes. In other words, what God was saying to Moses is, when everything you put your hand to, um, acknowledge my word in what you do. Put it on your hand, in essence. Uh, and, and as frontlets between your eyes, wherever you go, whatever you see, whatever you think, let it be based upon my word. Here's what happens when, uh, when we get a hold of something good that God has given us. The, what the Hebrews did, what the Jews did was uh, the Pharisees, and they still do today, they have, you see, the, this is a phylactery. It's a little box, and here's another one. They, what they did, what they did was they, they, um, they took what God said about hiding his word in your heart, and putting it on your hand, and putting it as frontlets between your eyes, and they made little miniature scrolls of the law, and they placed it in these little boxes, and so this is bound, do you see the binding? The word is bound to his hand, and it is in between the frontlets of his eyes, and uh, remember Jesus? He rebuked the Pharisees, he said, because your, your phylacteries are so large. Do you remember reading that in the gospel? You think by your large phylacteries that you have favor with God. In other words, the bigger your little box of scrolls. You might, dude, I mean, you could strap a Bible to your head. <laughs> it's not going to make you holy. You don't learn God's word by osmosis. You open up the pages and you study diligently hiding the word of God in your heart. Then it is on your hand so that whatever you put your hand to, you know what God's word says I should do with my hands. And you know what God's word says I should think and what I should see with my eyes because I've hidden it in my heart. Amen? Amen. Diligently studying his word. Friends, and God has promised to help us. Jesus said in, in John 16, verse 13, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. God's spirit dwelling within will guide you into all truth. What is truth? God's word. Psalm 73, verse 24, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward, <coughs> excuse me, receive me to glory. False religions, cults, will try to keep us from reading the scriptures. They'll say that only the enlightened leaders are skilled enough to understand. They will give passages often out of context to be memorized, and you're limited. They, they limit their people to what they can read, and, um, and they restrict them from owning a Bible. You, they don't want you to own a Bible because then you'll find out that your salvation is not based upon the church, but upon what Christ has done. It's a control tactic used. Why? Because the word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, 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 God's word. It's his revelation of himself. Who would keep us from God's word? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, here John says, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. What is John saying? He's saying there is an anointing that's in you so that you don't have need. Listen, it doesn't mean that you don't need, that we don't have need of teachers. Pa Paul, writing to the Ephesians, he said, God has given these gifts to the church. He's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers as gifts to the church. So for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. So pastors, teachers, evangelists, they are gifts from God. It doesn't mean that you don't need a teacher. But what Paul is saying is this, or John is saying is this, you don't need a teacher to know God. 
Hear me? Amen. You, you, when you came to Christ and the Spirit of God came to dwell within you, the, the Spirit of truth now dwells within you. That, that is an anointing from God. And the anointing of God will guide you into all truth so that you don't need, you are not beholden to any man or church or organization for, uh, to, uh, to know God. You hear me? You and you alone, alone in the presence of God with an open Bible in prayer, could, you can know all, the, all that God will reveal of himself. You don't have need of somebody instructing you. Uh, in other words, you're not beholden to anyone to know God. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? It's critical that we understand, that, that we, listen, God wants us to know him and he's given us his word and he's sent his spirit to reveal himself through his word. Amen. So where did God's word come from? We're just going to scratch the surface of this. We're not going to go deep into any um, great deep theology this morning, but it came by divine inspiration. Second Peter, Peter writing, he says this, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter says, a more sure word of prophecy. Now, depending on who you read, there is a, uh, a word of comparison given here. A more sure word. Well, more sure than what? It is a, comparison, uh, word, a comparative word here. Some say the more sure word is, uh, it's more sure than the testimony of the disciples. Because Peter just went through uh, talking about giving his testimony of what he saw in Christ. And, and he said, but we've been given a more sure word of prophecy. And some say, well, the more sure word, it, it's more sure than his testimony. That can't be the case because Peter's testimony later became scripture. Did I lose you? Are you with me? So the more sure word of prophecy is not more sure than the testimony of the apostles because the testimony of the apostles became God's word. So what is the more sure word? If you look at the context Peter, in, in 2 Peter, Peter is talking about false prophets and false teachers. He's talking about error. Listen, in, um, in verse 16, he says, he uses the term cunningly devised fables. Are, are you still with me? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he goes on to say, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word than what? Than the word of men, cunningly devised fables, false teachers and false prophets that were everywhere. Friends, there were many false teachers in Peter's day, just as there are today. Notice, in all the false religions, there was always another book of authority. Are you with me? Do you understand that? There's always another book. What is the ultimate authority? God's word. But in all of these other, all of these, uh, other uh, false religions, you will have, um, in the Latter-day Saints, you have the Book of Mormon. So you have the Bible plus the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon interprets the Bible. You have, in the uh, Jehovah's Witness, you have the Watchtower magazine. So you have the Word of God plus the Watchtower. You can't understand this without having the Watchtower. You have in the Roman Catholic Church from which I came, so don't get upset with me. I know what I'm talking about. I was there. You have apostolic tradition and uh, you have the living magisterium. In other words, we have the Word of God plus whatever else comes down through the magisterium. You have the Word of God plus something else. But friends, what is the ultimate authority of truth? Sola Scriptura. What is that? Scripture only. Why is that not going? It would have been more 
dramatic if I had hit the button on time. <laughs> Sola Scriptura, the Bible only, Scripture only, God's Word only. He, that is the ultimate authority on truth. So Peter says, we have been given, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It's the written word of God. Friends, even with, within evangelical circles, there are many practices that are not biblical. A lot of stuff, a lot of junk goes on in the modern Christian church that has nothing at all to do with God's word. Listen, it, God, does God want us to prosper? Uh, yes. Does he want us all to be billionaires? No. If he wanted us to be billionaires, we would all be billionaires. Does he, listen, oh man, where am I going here? The love of money is the root of all evil. I told you, I, I know some millionaires. I know one millionaire, you would never know he was a millionaire because he gives it all away all the time. Every year at the, end of his, at the end of the year, after he's paid his staff and he's taken his salary, um, he gives it all to world missions and he starts the next year with zero. And every year God prospers him. You would never know. Why? Because, why? because God trusts him. And knows that he can prosper him. He lives great in a nice house. But he, uh, God prospers him. Why? Because God knows that he doesn't love the money. He loves God. You hear me? A lot of stuff goes on. A lot of junk is taught in the church. And beyond that, all kinds of spooky stuff goes on in the church that has nothing at all to do with the word of God. And so, friends, we have to come back to God's word. Uh, uh, did, I, did I go too far off the beaten path here? Peter says, a more sure word of prophecy, and it's divined in the following verses. The word of prophecy is compared to a light shining in the darkness. We know Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Peter's audience would have known that, uh, that he was making a reference uh, to the Old Testament writings. The, the lamp, uh, uh, they would have known Psalm 119. Peter says that they were, these men of old, these holy men of old, were moved by the Holy Spirit. We're talking about where the Word of God came from. Men, people argue all the time, well, men wrote the Bible. Well, men sat down and did the writing, but where did it come from? Peter says, holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved by, uh, that term means to bear, to carry, to bring forth. Holy men of God were carried or, or born up. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 27, verses 15 and 17, of a ship being born by the wind. You with me? As the wind blows and it guides the ship and empowers the ship and it directs the ship, so the, the Spirit of the living God uh, breathed upon these men and directed them, borne them up, carried them along, empowered them, and directed them in the writing of His Holy Word. This is what it means. Listen. Knowing this first, Peter says, the reference to the, uh, reference to the importance. Know this first. No, the, the word of God was given by no private interpretation. Are you still with me? No private interpretation. It, first of all, um, the men that wrote this, the holy men of God who were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, didn't sit down and write their own opinions. They didn't say, I think I'll write this and this will be the scriptures. It was not by their own private interpretation. They were led by the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted them to write. And also, we need to understand it in this respect. Uh, scriptures, we, uh, understanding scriptures, must not, we must not attempt to interpret it according to our own desires. In other words, when we come to the scriptures, we must not read into the scriptures what we want it to say. Exactly. I could find scripture to say anything at all that I want it to say. It's like that young man who, <laughs> you heard me tell it, I'm going to get in trouble, it's stupid. But the young man who was looking for a wife, and he wanted to know uh, who God wanted him to marry. So he opened up the Bible. Grace be unto you. So he th started looking for a woman named Grace, because that's what God wanted him. See, I told you it was stupid. That's why you're not laughing. 
But we could find scripture to make it say whatever we want it to say. We could, no, so we, we're not, we're not, we, the scriptures are not by any private interpretation. It's not up to us what God's word says. God's word says what it says, and we have to study uh, and rightly divide it to understand it properly. You with me? Okay. How do we know it, what is true? Well, the Bible is the final authority on truth. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. God speaking to Abraham, Abraham to assure Abraham or reassure Abraham that his promise was true, God swore by himself. You understand that? How many times have you heard somebody say, because they really want you to believe what they're saying, and they say, I swear to God, or I swear on a stack of Bibles, I, I, I swear on my mother's grave, I, I swear on my kids' lives. You've heard people say that they find something to swear on uh, because that's a, a greater authority, and they think that if they swear upon this greater authority, it's going to give more assurance or more credibility to what they just said. So they swear by the higher. And, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, God, men swear by the higher, but when, who does God swear by? Because there's no one higher than God. So what Hebrew says is God, to reassure Abraham that, he, that his promises were true, he swore by himself because there is no higher than God. And it says by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon hope set before us. What are the two immutable things? The truthfulness of God's word and the faithfulness of his character. You with me? Amen. These two immutable things God swore by. By the, tr the truthfulness of his word and the faithfulness of his character. Friends, it is impossible for God to lie. Let me say that again. It is impossible for God to to lie. Titus 1 2, Paul writing there, he says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You say, If God is God, then there's nothing he can't do. Is there anything that God cannot do? Listen, there was a sermon that was preached. My pastor preached it. It's preached by many. If you go online, you'll see a whole bunch of people down through the years have preached this sermon entitled, Four Things God Doesn't Know. Have you ever heard that script, that sermon? Four things God doesn't know. He doesn't know a sin he doesn't hate. He doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. He doesn't know another way that you can be saved. And he doesn't know a better time than now. And all evangelists have preached that all over the place. Four things God doesn't know. Friends, is there anything God doesn't know? Absolutely nothing. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Everything possible, God knows. There's nothing God doesn't know. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Is there anything God can't do? Yes. He cannot lie. God cannot lie. Why? Because he is truth. He is perfect truth. Not just that he tells the truth, he is truth truth and the source of all truth his nature is truth his character is truth he is truth and perfect truth cannot become something else perfect truth cannot become a lie because it is perfect truth you understand so God who is perfect truth cannot lie it would be a contradiction of words and terms and uh, it's impossible that God could lie there's nothing that, that, so absolute truth he cannot do anything that is inconsistent with his character if God is truth his character is absolute truthfulness 
he can't do something that is contrary to who he is. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we say the Bible is true because it says it is true. Well, that's circular reasoning. The Bible is true because it says it is true, but that hasn't said anything. The Bible is true because it says it is true, and any other uh, uh, explanation for the universe's existence is illogical. The Bible's true because it says it's true, and nothing else makes sense. Nothing else. So we have a conflict. Conflict is God's knowledge versus man's knowledge. Man's knowledge. Uh, when I was, uh, well, let me say this. In 1930, you know what that is, right? That's Pluto. You can, you can see that, right? That's Pluto. But look at it, that's Pluto. That's Pluto. In, um, if you had sat down to write a paper in high school on the planets in our solar system, you, had, you would have written a paper on eight planets. You would have been correct. In 1930, Pluto was discovered. It became, it, was, it became part of the club. It became the ninth member of the club of planets. When I was a kid growing up, I got a set of encyclopedias. My mother bought them, Columbia encyclopedias. She bought them one a week in the grocery store. A dollar and a half or something like that. So, you know, over a year or so, we got the whole volume of it. I have written more term papers, not term papers, but more homework assignments out of the Columbia. You know, and if I sat down in the 60s, because that's when I came up, and I wrote a paper or did homework on the planets, I would have written about Pluto, and I would have gotten possibly, let's see, but I would have, at least I would have gotten a, a grade for my, my paper. But in 2006, Pluto was demoted. No longer a planet, it's now a dwarf. So if you took my encyclopedias from the 60s and you wrote a term paper or a homework assignment on the planets and you said there were nine and Pluto was one of them, you would have, now you would have gotten a, 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 ba a worse grade because it, it clearly is not true. It's not true. Pluto's not a planet after 2006. But in 2015, there was talk about reinstating it as a planet again. So Pluto might get re-promoted to being a planet. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? The wisdom of men, the knowledge of men. We, we think we know something. It's a fact. It's true. And then we find out it's not true. There is a society today. It's called the Flat Earth Society. Have you heard of it? And this is no joke. I want to laugh. But there are people who, otherwise intelligent people, who believe that the world is flat. They believe that uh, the Apollo space mission was done in a, in, a, in a studio in Hollywood, and it's all a fake, and none of it ever happened, and, uh, and, we don't, and the world is flat. They really believe the world is flat. Well, I remember in school, back in the 60s again, you know, who sailed the ocean blue in 1492? Yes. Right, whatever. Can't remember the song, but anyway, Christopher, 1492, Christopher Columbus. But, but people knew that the world was not flat even before Christopher Columbus sailed the earth. There were those who knew. And, and those who knew God's word knew that the world was not flat. Because Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 22, says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. That word circle is sphere. A sphere. So Isaiah knew that the earth was round all the way back before Columbus ever set sail. Long before. God's word, friends, is the ultimate authority on truth. You want to know if the world is flat or round? Read God's word. You want to know about planets or whatever? God just calls them by name. He says, there's many more planets. There are billions and trillions of planets that we'll never know and never see. My point is this. Man's knowledge, man's wisdom fails. God, God's word is the absolute truth. Amen? Amen? My pastor, Donald J. Evans, he used to say, uh, I've heard him say before, that the Bible says that Jonah su swallowed the whale. I mean, the whale swallowed Jonah. He said, the Bible says that the whale swallowed Jonah. 
But if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I would believe that too. <laughs> if, if God's word says it, friends, I believe it. If it's in here, then it's truth. It's absolute truth. So what do we do with it? If God's word was, was given by, by the breath of God, if, it was, uh, if, if, he, if he carried holy men of old by, his, uh, by the spirit of God and, and instructed them what to write and they wrote it and God's word is true and he's, he, he can't lie, then what are we to do with this? Well, the question being raised today is, is it relevant? And so you have a modern church that is constantly seeking relevance. How could we become relevant to this modern culture? So in many places, the word of God is watered down because we have to be relevant. It's outdated, so we have to be relevant. How do we become relevant in a modern world? Paul writing to Timothy, chapter 3, uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Are you still with me? Okay. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration is God breathed. All scripture is given by the breath of God, like the wind of God. God breathed into these men of old, and the word was, was written down. It is God breathed, first of all, and it is profitable. It is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine has become unfashionable in many churches today. You don't, they don't talk about doctrine. I've, I've said before, Leadership conferences and how to be a better leader and leaders this and lead. You want to grow church growth, grow your church, make better leaders. Um, again, I say, I've never read where Jesus called his disciples together to teach them leadership. He called them together to teach them servanthood. We, we should be servants, servant leaders, but servants. Uh, nonetheless, doctrine has fallen out of fashion. You, you don't, people... That's old-fashioned stuff. Sunday school, Bible study... That's old-fashioned stuff. Now, it's all feel-good. It's, all, uh, it's, all, it's, it's a different story. And the lack of doctrine has led to compromise within the church. Remember what Paul said? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said that there will come a day when people won't endure sound doctrine. Here's a problem, friends. We're almost done. You turn the page, you see, boom, conclusion. Here's the problem, or closing. Modern church is a social gospel. Love your neighbor. You better love your neighbor because Jesus told us to. But the whole idea of the modern culture is feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless, and, uh, and, and that's, that's really the emphasis. Now, all of those things are part of what our church, church should be doing, but doctrine, remember Peter said, first, doctrine. The modern church says, you do you. You know, have you heard that expression? How many, young, how many people are, have heard that? Raise your hand. Those are the youngsters in the church. You do you. In other words, you do you, I'll do me, we'll all be happy about this. In other words, you mind your own business and I'll mind mine. You do you. You drive. <laughs> you do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. Here's the problem with that. The Barna Group, you know, the Barna Research Group, Church Group, Christian Group, they do, they research. These are facts. Just came out. This, you'll notice here, this February 6th, uh, this past week, uh, the Barna Group came out with this research uh, that 47% of millennials, that's Christian millennials, believe it is wrong to evangelize. Listen. They, 98% said that they were equipped to evangelize, but 47, almost half of them said it was fundamentally wrong. It is wrong for me to go into my place of business and tell my coworkers about Christ. 
It is wrong. You do you, I'll do me. It's not my business to tell you about Jesus. So what? So what is, so how are people, so that tells me then, friends, if 47% of millennials believe it is wrong to be evangelized, then many of them themselves have not been evangelized. Amen. And so we're reaching a generation, but to what end? To build a church, a bigger church, but what do they believe? What are they doing? They believe that it is wrong to evangelize. Doctrine friends, is missing. The Word of God is missing. That's why we're doing what we're doing here. Love it, hate it, love me, hate me, you know, be for it or against it or indifferent. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Because the Word of God is not being taught in this generation. And, and because of that, there is error. And people don't know what God expects of them. They don't know who He is. They don't know what they're supposed to do. When God has made it abundantly clear, he's revealed himself in creation and his person in his word. And he said, come and study my word. Come and learn of me. I sent your spirit, my spirit to guide you so that you'll know me. And the world is like, I don't, I don't think that's important. I don't think I need to do that. In fact, it's wrong that I would ever tell anybody else. When the Great Commission, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if it's a social gospel you believe in that, well, we're just to love our neighbors. How could you love your neighbor if you know they're lost without Christ and they're going to hell and you won't tell them? Amen. Don't tell me you love your neighbor if you won't tell them about Jesus or at least pray for them. So doctrine, the word of God, we must know God's word. It is profitable for doctrine. Friends, God's word is the, is the standard. It is profitable for rebuke. Anybody ever been rebuked? <laughs> you know what it means to be rebuked? The word of God is a rebuke. It's, it, it brings conviction. I said I have had my face ripped off by God's word. When I opened up the scriptures and knew I was out of line, and I read something in God's word that brought conviction, Conviction, reproof, it, 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 it shows us our error. If we're not walking in line and step with God, God's word will tell us that we're out of step. God's word is profitable for reproof. God's word is the standard. No matter who you are, no matter what you think or how you feel, it's God's word that is the standard. It is profitable for correction. Not feelings, we're not led by feelings, but we're led by the truth of God's word, biblical truths. Just pointing out error is pointless. It's profitable for correction. In other words, don't just say, you're wrong. You walk up to somebody and tell them, you're wrong. You've just gained a friend for life. <laughs> Reproof says you're wrong. Correction says, but this is what we are to do. Why is that important? Because as Paul wrote to the Galatians, he says, Brethren, if a man or woman, we're not sexist, if a man or woman be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, uh, uh, Paul's not saying, take the Bible and beat him over the head. You're wrong. Turn or burn. Get right or get left. And he's, it's, not, it's not the spirit of of the, of, of, it's not the spirit of God. It's not the spirit of his word. But in love, he says, in love and in patience, you, you say to somebody, my friend, my brother, my sister, listen, the, the road you're on, the direction you're walking is wrong. God's word says here, it's wrong and I fear for you. But let, but let me show you, let me help you to get back on track. You know, come alongside, look, look at what God's word says. If you follow this, you see, it's God's word is profitable for reproof and for correction. And it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. In other words, in the right way to live. How does God want me to live? God's word tells us how we're to live. Very clearly, how we are to live, what we're to do. We're to live rightly. Our goal in life should be to be conformed to the image of Christ. Amen? Listen, I'm almost done, so let me, let me say it again. <laughs> Paul very clearly said in Romans 8, 29, our goal in life is to be, what is our goal? 
to be conformed into the image of Christ. Our goal in life is not to be rich and famous. Our goal in life is not to be successful, not primarily. Nothing wrong, again, there's nothing wrong if God prospers you. Nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with being famous if you can handle the pride. There's not, nothing wrong with those things, but those are not the goal or primary goal. The primary goal is being conformed into the image of Christ. Amen? God's word is profitable. It is, the, it, it is only scripture that can conform us into the image of Christ. So we put it into practice. First, you cannot put into practice what you do not know. How do I live? Uh, what do I do? What does God want of me? You can't put into practice what you don't know. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. What things? Is, what things is the Holy Spirit going to bring to your remembrance? I used to have a college professor, and at, at, at every test he would say, don't quote the scripture unless you've studied, because God's not going to bring to your remembrance what you haven't studied. Have you ever sat down at your computer, those of you who work with computers, and you look for a file? You know it's supposed to be there. It's a tax form, or it's a receipt, or it's an important document. It's a contract or something, and you, you desperately need it. But when you go to the file, it's empty. You never saved it. You didn't retain it. And so you can't retrieve it. You can't retrieve and the Holy Spirit can't help you remember what you have not studied, what you have not read, what you have not hidden in your heart. It's imperative, friends, that we study God's Word, that God's Word is our guide. So as we close, let me challenge you. After every sermon, because I do this, I've done this my whole Christian life. After, after every sermon you hear, after every Bible study you attend, after every Sunday school lesson, after every devotion you read, ask yourself, what fundamental teaching have I learned? Tomorrow, as you go to work, even today as you leave, think about what this, what, what, did, what, did, that, what did that rambling lunatic say? <laughs> what did he say? What was I supposed to learn from that? So you, what fundamental teaching have I learned? Secondly, where do I fall short? If this is what I'm supposed to know and supposed to learn, and here's where I am, where have I fallen short of what I'm supposed to know? Then thirdly, what can I do differently? If God's word says this and I'm here, what could I do? To, to bridge the gap. What, what could I do to be more in line with what God wants me to do? And then ask God to help you. Holy Spirit of God, help me to know your word. Help me to live your word. Help me to obey your word. Help me to be what you want me to be. Amen? Amen. God's word is a guide. For, it is the guide. It is the only guide. It is a complete guide if we'll submit to him, if we'll surrender to him. Let's close in prayer as we ask God's help. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we love you, Lord. We're so grateful that you love us. Lord, you didn't create us and leave us here to wander aimlessly. You gave us your word. You gave us your spirit to illuminate your word, to guide us in your word. As we study, Lord, we, we do so um, with diligence. We, we do so, Lord, that we might rightly divide your word, that we might hide it in our hearts. Lord, it's, let it be written upon our hands and upon our, our heads that, God, whatever we do, whatever we think, whatever we look upon, Lord, we will know your truth. I pray, Father God, that we will exercise your truth and, Lord, that we'll rely upon the inner spirit of God that brings conviction. When we're out of line, Lord, bring conviction. 
Lord, show us and teach us what we're to do. And when we need to remember, bring to our remembrance what we have studied. I pray, God, that we would mature in the things of God and that we would walk rightly before you, that you might be glorified in our lives. Lord, I pray that this, this message would find its place in each heart and, Lord, that we might, might make proper application. We ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Is in you and in you alone. Lord, our lives are in you. All we have is in you. Worthy is the Lamb of God.
No power of hell, no scheme of man can pluck us from your hand, O God. Here we stand in the power of Christ. Until you come and call us home, we stand in you, Lord Jesus. In Christ alone, in Christ alone, O God, in Christ alone, our life, our hope, our destiny, everything, Lord, is in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Thank you, Lord, for the cross of Christ where you purchased for us everlasting life by the blood of the Lamb. We stand in awe of you, Lord God. Here in the cross of Christ we stand. Bless the name of Jesus. Let's just Thank give him Jesus. praise this morning. You, Let's just give him thanks Thank today. That sin, the power of sin is broken. Christ is risen and alive. Precious Lamb, we worship you. Glory Thank to God you, Jesus, in the highest. We honor you, Lord, and worship you. You are the King of glory, 
You're the Lord of our lives. You're the Savior of our souls.